Hi, and welcome to Ask the Horse Live. I'm your host, Shoshana Rutsky, digital editor at The Horse. Tonight, we're discussing horses that have insulin resistance. We will delve into what issues insulin resistance causes, what can be done to help the horses, and any other considerations owners with insulin resistant horses should be aware of. This event is sponsored by Wellness Ready. To answer your questions tonight, we are joined by two expert panelists, Dr. Vern Dryden and Dr. Diane McFarlane. Welcome to you both. Dr. McFarlane, Hi. can you tell us a little bit about your background? Sure. Um, I am a professor and the department chair of large animal clinical sciences at the University of Florida College of Veterinary Medicine. I trained at UC Davis for my DVM, and I did a PhD and have done research in equine endocrine diseases for 20 years now, I guess. I've been studying that. Great. And then, um, Dr. Dryden, can you tell us a little bit about your background with insulin resistance and also about your role at Wellness Ready? Sure. Uh, so I started my, uh, I would guess, my endeavor with uh, laminitic cases young as a, as a young farrier um, back in Arizona. I started shooting horses when I was 17 um, and then transitioned to uh, vet school. I was the resident farrier at Washington State um, and really just had a love for treating uh, podiatry cases uh, from Washington State. I went to Root and Riddle Equine Hospital Lexington, Kentucky, and did an internship in podiatry and surgery. Uh, I stayed on as an associate uh, in the podiatry department, um, eventually became a partner there, uh, and eventually started my own practice in 2015, uh, Burr Oak uh, Veterinary and Podiatry Services. Um, my role has changed uh, from a active podiatrist now to more of a consultant. Um, and I do a lot more lameness and sports medicine. Um, but my desire to treat and help horses with laminitis has not changed. Um, and that's where Wellness Ready has come in because I dealt with so many cases that were uh, a result of metabolic uh, dysregulation, insulin resistance, um, and PPID that I wanted to, to have an effect and prevent these laminitic cases. and. So we developed a uh, stall side test that allows you to receive the insulin levels in a matter of minutes versus days. So that's where uh, my uh, my role in Wellness Ready is, is as a co-founder and the chief medical officer. Great, thank you. So before we get going with our questions, I want to remind everyone of our Ask the Horse Live format. We're starting with questions submitted during our event registration. If you're listening live and would like to submit a question, please do so via the chat window or the app. We'll do our best to get to as many of your questions as possible. If you're listening to the podcast recording of this event and would like to join us live in the future, please visit thehorse.com slash askthehorselive to register for notifications. And with that, we're going to jump right in. So to start, um, Dr. McFarlane, can you explain to us what it means for a horse to be insulin resistant? Sure. So insulin resistance is the term that we use to describe when the body doesn't respond appropriately to insulin. So to back up a little bit, the horse has a meal. From that meal, it's going to absorb sugars or glucose, and that is going to cause the pancreas to release insulin. Insulin goes out in the blood, and its job is to go to the tissues, such as muscle and adipose or fat, and that insulin triggers a whole line of events that happen in the cells that facilitate the uptake of glucose out of the blood. So when it works fine, you absorb the sugar, you release insulin, and then insulin causes that blood sugar to go into the muscle and into the um, other tissues. In the case of insulin resistance, the insulin is released, but it doesn't work appropriately at the cell, either because of a problem in the receptor or because of that pathway within the, within the cell. And what happens then is the glucose can stay higher in the blood, um, and that triggers more insulin to be released until finally the blood sugar drops. 
Um, in the horse, it's interesting because they also have some, we call it insulin dysregulation. So some of the people listening may have heard that term as well. And that is because you can also have a pancreas, that's the site of, of insulin release, that's just hyperactive. So when you get absorption of glucose, you get a lot of insulin release from the pancreas. And it's not necessarily the tissue's response to insulin that's as abnormal as it is the pancreas making too much insulin. So if you see the term insulin dysregulation, it, in, it includes insulin resistance. It's just a little bit broader. I hope that made sense. Yeah, definitely. And with that, can you also tell us a little bit about how insulin resistance is diagnosed? So um, there's a couple of tests that you may have had your vet do. Um, the least specific um, is just measuring insulin concentrations, just pulling a blood sample and measuring it. And why I say it's least specific is because many horses may have insulin resistance, but when you just grab a sample of blood, their insulin concentration is normal. So we usually try to do a challenge test. And the one that's done most commonly in practice is the oral sugar test, at least here in the United States. Um, there's a version of this that's also done in um, other countries where they can't get caro syrup. So the way we do oral sugar tests is we give sugar, and we do that by giving caro syrup orally to the horse, and then we measure after that, after that oral administration of glucose how much insulin is released. And in the horse that is insulin resistant or insulin dysregulated, they'll have a big release of insulin after a measured amount of glucose. There's another test that's not used as much but is um, also very effective, and that's the insulin tolerance test. And in that case, all we do is give an injection of insulin and see how much of the glucose drops. And so we know what a normal horse's glucose will drop. It'll drop by more than 50% with that dose of insulin. And if it doesn't drop as it should in response to insulin, then we know the horse is resistant to the action of insulin. Great, thank you. And then going over to Dr. Dryden for our next question. Taryn in the UK asked what age insulin resistant issues usually develop. That's a great question. Uh, typically around 10 to 12 years of age. However, I have encountered horses as young as five that can develop uh, insulin resistance. Great, and with that, are there any breeds that you have found to be more prone to insulin resistance issues than others? Absolutely. I, I think the first thing that comes to mind is ponies. Uh, if, you know, ponies are definitely predisposed. Um, I've dealt with a lot of warm blood, a lot of uh, quarter horses, and uh, saddlebred, standard bred uh, also are very prone to developing it. Great. And then also, one more for you, Dr. Dryden, while we're on it. Um, Drew from Kansas asked to, for a summary about how insulin resistance is typically treated. So we don't have enough time in, in, this, in this segment for, for everything. I'm just going to do a brief overview. Now, if a horse has an extremely high insulin level and it's critical, say you're, you're over 100, uh, we need to implement some serious drastic medical management changes. One of them is a drug that we use in human diabetes called metformin. Uh, I typically will dose this at a, a, a range of 30 mg per kg twice a day. Uh, that's my, my starting dose. Um, Dr. McFarlane, I'm sure, has her protocol. Um, uh, but otherwise, we're going to be aggressive on the, the dietary management of the horse, uh, cut out all non-structural carbohydrates if possible. Uh, we're going to switch over to a, a grass hay. I typically go to Timothy. Uh, we're going to soak that hay. Uh, we're going to pull them completely off of pasture. Um, and we're going to, if the horse is not laminitic and is able to move, we're going to implement an exercise program. So those are the, the, the key points that are kind of the takeaway as to how we manage these cases once you've identified them. Perfect. Thank you. And then going back over to Dr. McFarlane for our next question. Kelly from Texas is curious if a horse can be positive for PPID but not be insulin resistant. Yes, and that's something we've just learned a lot more about in the last couple of years, is that there are actually two different diseases. And so about two-thirds of the horses that have PPID are normal when it comes to their glucose insulin um, 
access. So it's about 30, 33% or so of horses that have PPID will also be insulin resistant. And those are the ones that you really need to be careful of because they're at high risk of having high insulins and they're at high risk of having laminitis. And the laminitis is typically more severe when they have both conditions. So if you have a horse with PPID and it's never had any problem with insulin and you have it tested and it's fine and it's never had laminitis and it's, it's thin and not heavy, then it's not at any more risk of laminitis than your other old horses. It's just that one third of the cases that have both conditions that you really need to be watching. Great. And then with that, Maurice from New York is wondering if you can explain any similarities and differences between insulin resistance, metabolic syndrome, and PPID. So if I start at the back end of that question, yeah. um, PPID, if we think about it, is an age-related disease. It's the disease where they tend to lose weight, so they lose muscle mass, and um, they are harder keepers, not easy keepers. They have the hair coat abnormalities that are affected, and they're more susceptible to getting um, infections secondarily. And it's actually a neurodegenerative disease. So it is, um, it's part of the brain pituitary axis that's abnormal. Insulin resistance, we've already defined, is actually at the level of the tissue where it doesn't respond to insulin appropriately. And metabolic syndrome is really just a description of that phenotype. In other words, the way the horse looks that puts it at risk of laminitis. So a horse that has metabolic syndrome is going to be insulin resistance, have insulin resistance or insulin dysregulation. And they're typically going to be our overweight horses, our easy keepers, our ones with high body condition scores. What makes it a little tricky is they, as as um, you already learned, the metabolic syndrome and insulin resistance is usually a middle-aged problem, and often they'll start to develop PPID as they get older. So there's a period of time where they have both conditions concurrently if they're that one-third of the cases that get both conditions. And so that's where it gets a little hard to figure out what's going on is when both conditions are developing. That makes a lot of sense. Thank you there. And then going back over to Dr. Dryden, Vicki from our live audience is asking what the signs of insulin resistance or dysregulation would be. She said that she has a shortage of vets in her area, so she wants to know what to look out for. It's a great question. Awareness is key. And so these are going to be your easy keepers. If you've noticed a change in their weight there, and yet you're not providing more uh, more feed, and they're just continuing, uh, continuing to to gain weight on air, if you will. They're easy keepers. Um, those are those are the ones that you definitely want to be vigilant of, and and check their insulin levels uh, periodically to make sure that you're not getting into the danger zone. Uh, so it's now there there is a subset of horses that will not present as your fat horse, but are in the early stages of insulin resistance that may not be obese. Uh, so it, it's a little bit of a tricky scene if you have an early onset, uh, and that's where screening comes in to be vigilant of uh, your horse's uh, insulin levels as well. Great, and then going back over to Dr. McFarlane for our next question. Linda in Virginia is asking about soaking hay. She's wondering if you recommend soaking hay and what your best method for soaking hay would be. So um, yes, soaking hay is a good way to try to reduce those non-structural carbohydrates. In other words, the, the sugars that are in hay. And so um, the typical way that most hay is soaked is just for 15 to minutes to about an hour. And you want to soak it. It doesn't matter if the water is cold or hot. It's, it's going to leach out those sugars from the hay into the water that it's soaking in. You want to be sure that you pull the hay out and you throw away that sugary water now, not where the horses are going to eat. So don't toss it out on the pasture, but maybe put it on your garden. Um, recycle that water. Um, but you want to go ahead and soak it that way, and that'll help reduce in the hay the amount of sugar that's present in that hay. Um, so it's a, 
um, a great method, uh, low cost of, re of taking hay. But um, I will mention, I think this will probably come up later, is that one other very important thing to do with your hay is to actually have it analyzed so you have, know how much sugar is in there to start. Great, and then you mentioned a little bit about not tossing the sugary water out on your um, pastures. But with that, for when the horses do go outside, if they have round bales and, you know, bales outside to be eating, how would you consider doing that for a horse that inside has their hay being soaked? I'm sorry, it's so a question, how would you soak the hay that's in a round bale? Sorry, yes. Yeah. So uh, would you recommend that they're just off of round bales entirely, or would you find some kind of balance between still letting them have that outside round bale and then just having the soaked hay inside? Well, ideally, you'd want to test the round bale um, and make sure that it has a low um, non-structural carbohydrate so that it's less than 10%, ideally. Um, I don't know of any way to soak it. Um, Dr. Dryden, do you have a way to soak round bales? I'm not aware of any way. No, because then you get botulism. Um, oh, there you go. <laughs> yeah, so it's, really, so it's, a, it's really just a management scenario, unfortunately. Yeah. yeah. Great. Great. And then we'll go to um, Dr. Dryden for our next question. We also got a few people who asked about soaking green. Would that cause any difference with uh, horses with insulin resistant issues or not really? Yeah, so you do, you will get the same, a similar effect with soaking the grain as uh, hay. You will get leaching of the sugars, but ideally with horses with insulin resistance, you're going to pull them completely off non structural carbohydrates, any concentrate seeds. So I typically pull them completely off of grains and I go to just a ration balancer so that they're getting, they're getting the protein they need and the minerals that they need, but they're not getting the non structural carbohydrates. So Typically, that's, that's my protocol. I pull them completely off the grain, so it's not even an issue for those cases. That makes a lot of sense there. And then we'll go back to Dr. McFarlane. We had Janet from our live audience ask about feeding horses alfalfa and if that would be okay for a horse with insulin resistance issues. No, our ideal feed is going to be a mature grass hay, um, long stemmed. Um, that is the one that's going to have our lowest non structural carbohydrate. So that's really what we recommend. Um, and um, you can't look at a hay and know what it, what kind of sugar content it has. Um, and again, um, our, our best, the best one, and I agree completely, no grain, no pasture, and a grass hay. That is really the way we want to go because this is a life-threatening condition. Um, the laminitis can be very severe and some of these horses are going to respond so um, uh, profoundly if you have um, non-structural carbohydrates or sugars in their diet. So I think it's important to try to stick as close to the plan as possible. Great. And then, Dr. Dryden, you mentioned a little bit about pulling horses off of grain. We have Renee in North Carolina wondering what she can feed her insulin-resistant horse to help him gain weight without also jeopardizing his health. That's a great question. I, I typically will go to uh, like a flaxseed oil or a flaxseed mill or a oil top dressing that is a uh, high in omega-3 uh, fatty acids. So that's, that's my go-to to help with, a, you know, a, a top line, if you will, on a horse. Uh, I have a lot of show horses in my, in my uh, uh, practice that, that are uh, insulin resistant that I need to maintain a good look to. And that's that's my go-to is I'll go to a flax um, and or an omega fat omega three fatty acid. But I would also say if you're noticing a lot of weight loss, not just um, a horse that's in performance and not filled out, but if you're noticing weight loss, that you want to also be sure to do a full physical and um, have your vet come out and look at the horse because it may be developing PPID and there's things we can do to treat that and it may have a lot of pain if the feet are sore pain is another reason to lose weight so um, it also depends a little bit on what kind of a weight loss you're dealing with with your horse that's a that's actually a great a great comment and, and to that I would also say you should probably get the get their mouth checked out and make sure they don't have any parasitic infection, infestation. I mean, there's a lot of reasons for that. And that's a great point. Yeah, absolutely.
Great, thank you both for those answers. That was really helpful there. And then for our next one, Dr. McFarlane, Kay from our audience um, is wondering what the correlation between glucose and insulin levels in horses would be. Well, glucose is going to drive the insulin release, so they're they're completely related. Insulin is released in response to high blood glucose. So when you can't get that glucose out of the blood because the cells are not responding to insulin, then more insulin is going to be released. And that's the problem with the horse is that they continually make more insulin until they drive that glucose down. Great. Perfect. Thank you there. And then going to Dr. Dryden, I know you mentioned a little bit before that pulling horses off of pasture is important. Roxanne from Pennsylvania said that her horse is currently on meds for insulin resistance and is doing well and is at a good weight. And she's wondering if withholding grazing is still necessary. Yes, that is a tricky, tricky question. Um, these <laughs> horses, it's a, it's a lifetime management scenario. Uh, once, once they are insulin resistant, they may have a, a good spell and you're managing it well. The moment you turn your back and you allow them to uh, ingest a large amount of uh, non-structural carbohydrates that turns into glucose, their body releases a ton of insulin in response to it, and you get you get a profound laminetic response. So it is it is a very a very tricky scenario. Um, I will say that there are times when it is I, I allow clients to have a little bit more pasture time based on seasonality, and and Dr. McFarlane can can comment on this. Um, you know, it, there are times when it's, it's better, say, uh, in the middle of summer, you definitely don't want to allow them to have pasture in transitional period, spring and fall, uh, because the sugar content in the, in the forage goes up. Um, so it is a very tricky spot for, for clients to understand that, okay, this is the lifetime management scenario. And while you may get away with it at some point, it's not going to be a, a full-on, okay, just turn it back out in pasture. I, and I hope, I hope that makes sense. Yeah, that does. And with that, um, Katen from our live audience is wondering if insulin resistance is ever reversible or if it is just a lifetime thing at that point. Uh, so in my opinion, it, it is a lifetime management scenario. Dr. McFarlane, you, you can comment to this, but I, I haven't found one that I've been successful in just returning back to normal life and saying, okay, go live your life in a pasture. Yeah, it, it's a combination of the horse's genetics and the environment and how we feed them. And so the genetics are there. And that's why we talked um, when we first started with these horses are the easy keepers typically. And so that's a genetic. That is something that's genetic. And so they're always going to have the predisposition. Now, some of them may have been mismanaged. And by that, I don't mean anything negative to the owners. I mean, we just gave them too much feed for their genetics. And so it may be that you can, um, in some of them that are not severely affected, get where you can be a little less rigorous on their control. But they will always be um, at risk because of their genetic background. Great answers there. And then sticking with Dr. McFarlane for our next one. Joan in Ohio is curious if a horse having insulin resistance is the same or similar to a human with diabetes. Oh, I love that question. <laughs> um, it, it is not the same, but it is a little bit similar. And in people, they actually also have metabolic syndrome, and that is pre-diabetes. So diabetes is actually referring to when you have um, the inability to make insulin sufficiently to get the blood glucose dropped. And in our horses, when we measure our horses with insulin resistance, their blood glucose is usually normal. It's their insulin is very high. And that insulin being high compensates for the, uh, um, the inability to drive it into the cell. So we, it actually makes, the horse makes enough insulin so that their glucose becomes normal. In people, over time, their pancreas actually loses the ability to make insulin, and that's what diabetes is. So in our horse, they're remarkably capable to make insulin at high concentrations for a really long time, which would be terrific if our only concern was getting that blood glucose down. But unfortunately, because their feet um, 
are sensitive to the insulin and have laminitis in response to high insulin, it's a problem in the horse that they have such great pancreas um, ability to make insulin. Great, thank you. And then going back to Dr. Dryden for our next one. Sean in Massachusetts is wondering if horses with insulin re resistant issues are also more prone to skin issues. You know, that is a that's another really good question. I have found that on a lot of my cases that are insulin resistant have allergy issues and have uh, irritable skin and have weepy eyes. And I think that when they have a high insulin, it causes a kind of a pro-inflammatory response uh, system-wide. So it's not just a, we, we always think of laminitis, but also there are other areas that are in, inflamed. And uh, so going to say reproductively, you have horses that cannot get in full because their reproductive organs are inflamed due to insulin resistance, hyperinsulinemia. So I do think that there is a component of chronic inflammatory disease that is associated with hyperinsulinemia for an extended period of time. Great. And then with that, Dr. Dryden, I think this is relevant to you as well, because if I'm remembering right, you've read some quarter horses. Um, Ion in Texas is curious if it is safe to breed a mare that has insulin resistance. Good question. So knowing the horse's uh, uh, propensity to become uh, insulin resistant and, and, and have laminitis episode, in the third trimester, there, it is very well known that insulin can spike and become a problem for uh, mares and foals. So that's what that's a strong consideration to have when you when you're making a a, a judgment about whether or not to breed a mare and to have them carry a foal. Uh, I do think that a, probably a better option, uh, knowing especially if a horse has already had a laminitis episode and is insulin resistant, I definitely would not choose to breed them and carry a foal. I think it would be far better if your breed allows to have uh, embryo transfer done or ICSI performed in order to, to harvest oocytes and, and fertilize uh, in vitro. So um, that, that's my recommendations. If you know the horse has a problem, especially if they've already had a laminitis episode, I wouldn't push the issue. Great, thank you. And then back to Dr. McFarlane for our next one. Cindy in our live audience is wondering what benefit metabolic or insulin supplements might play in controlling insulin resistance? So there's a lot of different supplements on the market, and I don't think we can answer this um, with a lot of evidence in a global fashion. Um, so I can't really answer that um, to say that one or the other um, is helpful. There are a lot of things that have been suggested um, chromium, cinnamon, lots of things like that, and most of them, there's not any evidence um, in a well-designed study that supports that that is effective. Um, so I don't really have a recommendation when it comes to um, items that you can supplement that will change um, the, the insulin response. And then going right off of that, um, also any thoughts on certain vitamins and minerals that might help an insulin resistant horse? Again, I don't think that there's really great evidence-based um, studies that support the supplementation of any one thing, but it is important to remember if you're soaking your hay, you're gonna leach out minerals um, and some of the other nutrients from the hay. So you do wanna go ahead and give uh, balance, uh, uh, ration balancer, and that'll also help replace some of the amino acids. Now, one thing to be careful of is if you have a horse that's just not responding and you are using a balancer, some of the balancers have amino acids that can actually cause release of insulin as well. So you might look at those balancers and you might talk to your vet because you can always do um, an insulin concentration after you feed the meal to make sure that the meal with the ba ration balancer isn't causing an insulin spike. Um, so you can test those things in the particular horse. But I don't have a very good global um, answer to that because there's just not a lot of research to support um, one thing over another being particularly effective. Thank you. And then for our next question, we're going to go to Dr. Dryden.
Um, Kathy in our live audience says that she has a 23 year old horse who is on an insulin supplement, minerals, senior grain, and Timothy Hay. She's wondering what kind of special exercise regimen he should or shouldn't be on. Uh, exercise is extremely important to help with uh, the metabolic standpoint of the horse. So I, I say at least 15 to 20 minutes a day um, if the horse is able to. Uh, they need to be moving around. Horses uh, naturally need to be moving. Um, so if you can put them on a walker, or a treadmill, you know, for 15 to 20 minutes a day, uh, that, that should be sufficient to keep their uh, metabolism going so that they are able to utilize energy properly. Um, so I, if it's a situation that the horse has laminitis, you know, it is going to be tricky to, to get that exercise regimen in. But we always tell clients you, you can do what the horse will allow um, and then build on that. So um, my recommendation is as, as much as possible without uh, endangering the horse's well-being. Great, thank you. And then going back to Dr. McFarlane for our next, Sarah in South Carolina is wondering how she can help manage a horse with insulin resistant issues who is within a herd of horses who don't have insulin resistant issues and she doesn't have the ability to split them up. I had a very large herd of horses um, in Oklahoma that had various different types of needs to eat, and I didn't want to split them. So I had just run in pens, and so I ran the horses into separate pens and then fed them there. So they were just um, stock pens, um, so a little area that's fenced off to allow you to feed the horse individually um, would be the way I would approach it. Um, Often the horses that have insulin resistance are really good eaters, and they're usually pretty competitive about the food. So you can't feed them um, in a group because they're going to get more than their share typically. So um, I would think about, is there a way where they're being kept, and hopefully this isn't out in pasture, but is there a way where they're being kept that you can um, just separate them for the time that they eat and then release them back out? That makes a lot of sense there. And then going to Dr. Dryden for our next question. Donna in Illinois wants to know if it's likely that her insulin resistant founder prone pony will need shoes forever. Oh, yeah, that's another great question. Um, it's hard to say. At many of these cases, we can turn around quickly. Uh, it, it really depends on how much damage is done initially by the laminitis episode. Uh, as Dr. McFarlane commented earlier, these can be devastating uh, laminitis episodes when you have uh, an insulin hyperinsulinemia impact on them. Um, it, it would be a case by case scenario. I, I think, you know, consult with your veterinarian, get radiographs, uh, work with your vet and your farrier. Um, many of them can go back to barefoot, but I think, again, it's a more of a, a, a long term management scenario. And uh, it's, it's really each case is an individual and how much laminitis, uh, the damage is done by laminitis initially. Great, thank you. And then Dr. McFarlane, to expand on that a little bit, we have a few people asking about the connection between insulin resistance and laminitis. Can you expand a little bit on that and how they can go hand in hand? So there's some very good evidence that we've learned probably in the last 15 years that insulin itself directly causes laminitis. So you can take a perfectly normal animal and if it gets delivered high concentrations of insulin, within 12 hours you can start to see changes in the feet. And by three days, they're actually sore-footed. And so we know that insulin directly can, directly causes the change of laminitis. What we don't know yet is exactly how it happens mechanistically in the foot. Um, it, it's beyond the scope of this, this um, conversation to go into all the details about all the receptors that are there and not there. So we don't know exactly what it's doing, but we know that it is insulin that directly causes the laminitis in the feet. Great, thank you. And then going back to Dr. Dryden, Nancy in our live chat is uh, I'm wondering when testing hay, what numbers you would be looking at for insulin resistant horses. And she's also wondering 
with if there's any differences when you're looking at things for donkeys versus horses? Really good question. And I would say my generic question is the lowest possible. <laughs> and, then <laughs> I'm going to, and then I'm going to kick it back over to Dr. McFarland for, for her uh, response. So the numbers I usually see tossed around, and I agree, it's the lowest you can possibly um, find, but the number that's usually um, I see tossed around is that you want a non-structural carbohydrate of less than 10% if you can get it. If you have 12%, that's probably okay, but 10 to 12%. If you are on the higher end, um, you may be able to get as much of half as that out through soaking the hay. Um, but you target trying to get less than 10%. And I'm not touching the donkey part. You're going to have to answer the donkey question. <laughs> okay, I'll answer the donkey question. Now, <laughs> we we always overfeed donkeys. Donkeys are made to live in arid environments in the desert. And, and they're hardy, hardy animals. And they're not meant to have lush forage and pasture and grain. We overfeed donkeys terribly. So... Um, it's, it's really every donkey that I see, I think is, you know, at, at least in, in, you know, the U S that's not a working animal is probably obese now. And it's really just because we feed donkeys like we feed our horses and they're not made to do that. They're, they're made to, to be out working, uh, foraging in arid environments. So I think we really have to reel back our enthusiasm for caring for not not caring for but feeding these animals and realize that their their metabolism is far different than than a horse going back to the natural way that these animals live um, certainly our very thrifty ponies are one step between the donkeys and the horses and if you think about not only do they live where there's not much food for them but they eat all day long and we tend to feed periodically. And so um, another thing we can do to keep the sugar from spiking is to break these meals into as, as small and frequent of meals as we can do. So if we feed small meals throughout the day, that's beneficial as opposed to two big meals at other end. Now, I know people have jobs and lives and can't always do it, but there are some um, strategies for that. But So the smaller meals are better than less frequent, bigger meals. Perfect. Yes, and then Dr. McFarlane, Rhonda from Kansas is wondering what kinds of treats she can feed her insulin-resistant horse. So the best answer is no treats. Um, kisses and hugs are going to be safer, but if you do need to do treats, um, again, you're trying to pick out things that, um, if it was a person, we'd be saying low glycemic index. So you want to pick things that are not full of sugar. Um, some strawberries are good. If you're I've heard that horses will eat cauliflower. I've not personally witnessed it, but that's a very good possibility. Um, there are some uh, commercially made treats specifically for EMS horses. I don't have any experience on those personally, but you're trying to find those things that have the least amount of sugar. Um, so some of the fruits and vegetables that are low in um, sugars would be good. Obviously, avoid sugar, um, <laughs> avoid Watermelon, that's high in sugar. So look for those low glycemic index fruits um, would be uh, one of my recommendations. My, my, I always tell my clients, celery. Horses love celery. Yeah. You chop them up into little sticks, and they love them. And about the lowest glycemic index you can find. Yeah, that's a great one. Great. And then back to Dr. Dryden for our next question. Chrissy in South Dakota is wondering about any special considerations for treating an insulin-resistant horse who also has ulcers. Okay. Special considerations. Um, you know, typically horses that have ulcers, I, I, do like, I do like to put them on alfalfa. Now that's not going to be great for an insulin-resistant horse. So I, I think we're just going to have to be conscientious of, of you know, timing and, uh, you know, make sure that that horse has uh, continuous feed throughout the day, like Dr. McFarlane said. Um, really, it's just going to be managing them like an insulin-resistant horse, plus adding whatever medication and reducing stressors that trigger uh, that horse that may uh, worsen the, the ulcers. Perfect. And then back to Dr. McFarlane for our next question. 
Ashley in New Jersey is wondering if there is a certain time of year that is best to test for insulin resistant issues or if you can test any time year round. Um, the, it depends a little bit on the case that we're talking about. If it's a horse that's getting a bit older, they're more likely to have problems um, if they're having concurrent problems with their pituitary, if they're starting to develop pituitary dysfunction, then the fall and the spring are when they're going to be most abnormal. And also that's when the, um, in most locations where the grass is going to be most lush um, and feed is going to be most lush and you pick up positive. But really you can test any time of year and if you're having trouble with the feet, um, that would be definitely a time to test. So you don't need to really restrict it by season, but if you're not seeing any clinical signs, you um, might go at the time that they're most likely to have high insulins, and that's going to be based on um, what they're eating and when they're eating it, um, as well as potentially in the fall if they're older horses that you think may have concurrent PPID. This is a question specifically for you, Dr. McFarling. Um, how important do you feel that it is to check insulin levels in a normal routine on a horse? Say, say they've just been on pasture for a couple hours, they come in. Do you feel like it's important to check insulin levels, you know, at that point or, or completely fasted? What is your take on when we check insulin levels? Oh, I actually don't like the completely fasted. I think that it's, um, the um, post-fed sample is a little bit more useful. And I actually really, one of the things I love to recommend is if we're having a horse that we know has some issues and it's just not responding, is actually go ahead and give it its meal and then test the insulin. Because um, on, on the pasture, after the meal, that's when they're at risk of having the high insulin. And so the fasting, you get into some problems with, the stress that goes with fasting, and then that can affect cortisol, and cortisol can affect insulin. So um, most normal horses, if you're testing them coming off the pasture, will be pretty normal in their insulins. Um, so that's my preference. What about you? <laughs> that's exactly the way that I think, and and I think it's important to look at it in their normal their normal state after a, uh, after a meal to know whether or not they're going to be triggered and have a hyper hyper insulinemic uh, uh, episode and lead to laminitis. So I, I think that it's critical to, to check them at that point because that's when they're going to be triggered. Right. And it is important that you use, um, you know, some of the cutoffs that you may see, diagnostic, diagnostic cutoff, may be based on a fasted horse, but there's also cutoffs available for having come in off a of pasture. And those would be the ones that would be more relevant. Um, but I think it's important. We're looking at a disease that is triggered by eating and meals. And so I think, I, I agree, the more natural situation is probably the best way to look at it. And then looking at testing as well, Takara from our live chat is wondering how often you would recommend testing insulin levels. So if you have, okay, say you're, you're just doing a screening test, the horse has uh, elevated insulin levels, you're going to implement a either a medical management treatment and also uh, dietary and exercise management, I would come back in, a, in no more than two weeks and recheck insulin to make sure that your program is working. Um, it depends on the availability of, of testing and the, you know, your, how, how soon you can get your vet back out. But I have seen drastic changes in as little as days once we implement a, a protocol for treatment. So I do think that it's important to Look at this as a trend and, and watch your management uh, and give and your vet can uh, evaluate their protocol uh, by doing that. Uh, so I think more more testing is important to know what's happening in, uh, in the horse's insulin level. And the only thing I might add is um, I agree that you want to have a good follow up and this is how we're going to know that our our interventions are appropriate and working, and if we need to add drugs, if we're not using drugs, if we need to look at our, um, our ration balancer, if it's not working in the particular horse, it's causing some insulin release, et cetera. The, the only thing I might back up and say is all of that conversation is based on the idea that we're looking in a horse that has some physical changes of insulin resistance. 
you have to be a little careful using diagnostic tests in perfectly normal horses because you're more likely to get false positives. And this is not just insulin, this is any test. So if you have no indication that there's anything abnormal in the horse, um, you don't want to run a bunch of different tests on that horse because something just by chance is going to be abnormal. So that whole, I agree 100% with that scenario as um, as it applies to a horse that has some signs that make you suspicious that it has insulin resistance. Exactly, the phenotypically suspect horse. Exactly. Great, and then Dr. Dryden, um, Takara in our live chat is also saying that she has a horse who has an insulin level of 97.5 and she has been on a supplement to correct low circulating thyroid hormone for a month, but has gained some weight. She's wondering if she should see a weight change at this point. And she said that she's also in a dry lot with prairie hay. Well, some of these, some of these cases are very difficult to manage and are refractory uh, to treatment. So I, I think that uh, at this point, I would have her consult with her veterinarian. I think uh, adding a medication, um, and this is completely between her and her veterinarian, but adding a medication that may help drive insulin down to normalize to normalize insulin, because 97 is is a, is very high. In my opinion, that's that's critical, and you know you're you're going to get you know in the range of possibly having a laminitis episode, if not already having uh, some issues there. So. Um, definitely want to get with uh, your veterinarian in that scenario and look at some medical management uh, on top of uh, the thyroid, you know, adding some uh, exercise and, and making sure that there's no other uh, additional feed that's getting to the horse or, or non-structural carbohydrates is important too. Perfect. Thank you. And then Dr. McFarlane for our next question. Margaret said that her insulin-resistant gelding is currently on stall rest after injuring himself. Even without going out on pasture, he's gaining weight, and she's wondering if you have any advice. So I think not knowing the injury, not knowing um, a lot of details, I think this is another case where probably you need to have um, your vet out there. Um, if the insulin's not crawling up and the weight's just a little bit increased, from being sedentary, I'm not getting as worried. But if you have your vet out and they can do a full exam and then see if we're if your horse is actually becoming less insulin sensitive, then it is it is more critical. And again, it goes back to really looking at every single thing that the horse is consuming. And it may be even if you're at what you think is a pretty low amount of of hay that you test it, you still may be able to take it down to a lower amount because it's going to need less if it's moving less. And so I think these very complicated cases, um, it's very hard for us to give very specific advice without seeing the horse. And so in those type of cases, you really need to consult with your vet so that we don't um, inadvertently lead you down the wrong path. Perfect, thank you. And for everyone listening in our live audience right now, we have about 10 more minutes. So definitely be sure to get any other questions that you might have. And with that, we have Tony from our live audience asking if hay loses its sugar as it ages. And if you analyze the hay, how long are those values good for? And we'll give that one to Dr. Dryden. Ooh, that's a good one. So personally, I, I don't have a great answer for uh, decay of, of non-structural carbohydrates in time. Um, I, that would be a great question for Dr. McFarlane if you have any input <laughs> into that scenario. Um, as far as I know, you don't actually lose the sugar once the once it's been um, cured in the haze. Um, if you're talking about hay that's already been um, cut, no, you, I don't believe you do lose the sugars over time. Um, it's more mature when you cut it, it's going to have lower sugars. Um, but that's about what I know because I am also not a nutritionist <laughs> by training. Um, and so if you test it, it should be um, reasonably stable for that concentration of sugars over the course that you would have that hay and still have it look good enough to feed your horse. Great, thank you. And I know we've talked a little bit about turning horses out in grass already, but we got a bunch of questions for those. 
Um, for example, Diane from South Carolina is wondering if it is safe for her insulin resistant horse to graze on the pasture in winter. And I'll give that one to Dr. Dryden. So short answer, probably not. Um, if <laughs> I, I don't, I don't recommend pasture for any of my insulin resistant horses. Uh, that are diagnosed as insulin resistant. Um, and at most, I will allow them to be on pasture with a muzzle. Uh, so even if, unless it's a completely just annihilated pasture where that, you know, it's got no growth on it, a dry lot essentially, uh, you're still at risk because even, even in Kentucky in the middle of winter, it will bloom. You'll get a day, a couple of days, some sunshine, and it will bloom, and then you'll you'll have a, a laminitis episode. I've seen it far too many times. So I think the the best advice is, I'm sorry, but pasture is just not a safe component for for these cases. And then with that, Nicole in Oregon said that her insulin resistance mare only seems to pack on the pounds when her grass turns dry and yellow in July to September. Why would that be? I don't have a specific answer, but I can tell you that you can't tell by looking at the grass what its concentration of, of the non-structural carbohydrates are. And so it's possible that you just have higher sugar in your grasses at that time of year. Um, I, I don't actually know the answer if that's what it is, if it's other hormones coming into play, um, but you can't look and say, oh, this it's turning colors now the sugars have gone down lower. You really have to test to know. And it's the same thing. You can't look at a hay and know that that's going to be a low sugar or a high sugar hay. You really need to test. So um, so I don't have a great answer, but that's all I can uh, say for that question. Great. And then um, Dr. Terry McFarlane again. Um, Jan from our live chat is wondering if there are any at-home tests a horse can a horse owner can use to test insulin, similar to human or dog or cat at-home tests. Well, the, Dr. Dryden will have to speak to the tests that they have, but I believe it still requires the veterinarian to do um, the wellness ready test, and so really it is a veterinary um, diagnosis, it, and their test, as I understand, is just that it is done stall side. There isn't an insulin test um, that's used for small animals either um, that is done stall side. In humans, usually it's a glucose test of glucose in the urine, and horses don't spill their glucose in their urine as quickly as people do because they don't get high blood glucoses. We're worried about high insulins. So, Dr. Dryden, did I speak correctly? That it's still a veterinary test, but it's done stall side. That's correct. We we still we want the veterinarians to be involved and to make the diagnosis. We don't. Uh, it's 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 a little bit of a tricky subject because we don't want uh, improper diagnoses to be made and and management to be implemented without the veterinary involvement. So um, it is it is going to be utilized by veterinarians. And you're correct. It is a a stall side stall side test that takes 15 minutes to run using whole blood and. Uh, um, get it through your veterinarian. I will say that one thing is that you can look at your horse phenotypically, and if your horse is um, obese, has a high body condition score, has a crusty neck, has regional adiposity, in other words, the crusty neck, fat pads um, up in the sheath area around the tail head, or showing signs of laminitis, then you need to act. You know you have a horse that has insulin resistance with those clinical signs. Great, thank you. And then talking about laminitis a little bit more there, Dr. Dryden, um, Kayton in our chat is asking if all insulin resistant horses with laminitis would benefit from shoe support and how that would work. Uh, so typically, um, I don't recommend changing shoeing unless I have uh, something to go off, like active displacement of the coffin bone, or I know that the, there's some, some shift in the dynamic of the foot. I try to support the, the foot initially during a uh, acute episode um, with, say, uh, a boot or something to reduce concussion, um, and then, you know, work on the horse with uh, putting them in ice, uh, medical management through NSAIDs, uh, obviously, uh, getting to the root of the issue, whether it be insulin resistance or some other 
other issue, but uh, not all of them um, I recommend shoeing for. Some of them you want to get through the acute phase before you put a rigid appliance on the foot because they can go backwards really quick if you if you're too abrupt in your in your choice for for shoeing protocol. So I really it's it's really a a, a, a very specific and very uh, finite uh, question, but in 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 reality, I I would say it's case specific, and I don't uh, recommend putting something on during the acute phase. Great, thank you. And then for our Dr. McFarlane, Kathy in British Columbia is wondering if insulin levels are naturally higher in the spring and fall. Only based on um, if they're eating foods that, um, if they're out on grass and pastures that have higher sugars. So the horse itself doesn't have much seasonal rhythm to the insulins like they do the pituitary hormone. So it's more based on the diet changes that occur um, during the season is my understanding. Perfect. And then um, for Dr. Dryden, Jane is wondering your thoughts on feeding straw to insulin resistant horses to combat boredom if they can't have as much hay as they would like to have. So I, I wouldn't recommend straw just because of my worry of them becoming impacted if they if they ingest too much um, having a, a GI issue. I, I would recommend uh, just to keep the horse busy doing a slow feed um, hay net so that they, they have to really nibble and pick through it um, just to keep them occupied and happy. Uh, but I, I think that straw would probably be uh, ill-advised for me just because I worry about a horse getting too much and the getting an impaction. Great, thank you. And then back to Dr. McFarlane. Lisa in Missouri is wondering if protein levels in hay pay, um, play any influence for insulin-resistant horses. Well, they can. There's certain amino acids that, just like glucose, do cause release of insulin, and those can be in the hays. They can also be in that ration balancer. So that's the tricky part, and that's why it's good to make your changes on the diet and then come back and measure insulin. And if it, if you're not getting the, um, the correction that you need to see, if they're still having high insulin concentrations, then you need to look at changing some things individually. But yes, some, some amino acids, the building blocks of proteins, do stimulate insulin release. And that can be some of the ones that when you have a horse that's not responding well, that may be why. Great, and then we also have one final question from our chat for the night from Heather. And she is wondering your opinions on senior feed version versus a ration balancer for horses with insulin resistant issues. And we'll give that one to Dr. Dryden. Yep, so again, I, I always choose to just take them off of, uh, off of any concentrate feeds and go to a ration balancer. Um, and, and then follow up with another insulin test to make sure that things are going appropriately. Um, it's, that's just my protocol. Sometimes you get into a sticky situation with a, with a geriatric horse that doesn't have a good dentation, that doesn't have good teeth, that you need to feed uh, a mash or, or something too. Um, so we just have to be conscientious of, of our patient, but typically I, I take them off all concentrate. Perfect, thank you. Well, that's all we have time for tonight, and I would like to thank both of you for joining us. Thank you for having thank me. Thank you. Also, we would like to thank Wellness Ready for sponsoring this event. And finally, thank you to our audience for listening and sending in all of these great questions. Until next time, from everyone at the horse, have a great night.